Thank you for joining us in worship today. Welcome. It is so good to worship the Lord together. I pray that as we gather together today that you experience the Lord, worship Him in spirit and truth, both through song and the preaching of His Word. I'm especially excited about our current uh, walk through the book of Revelation. This is a wonderful book of God's Word in which we find comfort for the day, but also a reminder to know that uh, Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that He is in control, and that we want to live our lives faithfully following Him. Amen. Hear the words of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. This is the words of God talking about Jesus, and He says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord our God, Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. We're going to sing this morning about that sure foundation. Let's stand as we sing together. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord.
Thank you. Be seated, please. Amen. He is all to us. And I pray that as we come into this room this morning, that out of the overflow of our hearts, we let him know that. Thank you for being here in worship today, and welcome to worship. It is a joy to be in the Lord's house. If you're visiting with us today, thank you for being here. We would love to know of your presence with us, so if you would please fill out one of those visitor cards on the pew back in front of you. Uh, we would love to know how we might minister to you and reach out to you in the days ahead. Psalm 143 in verse 10 says this, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Let's go to the Lord this morning and ask his good spirit to lead us as we worship him today. Our Father, we bow our hearts before you in mercy and in your grace this morning, knowing that, Lord, we are not worthy to come into your presence. We're not worthy to utter uh, words before your throne of of righteousness but Lord we also know that that throne is full of mercy and grace and Lord it is by your awesome sacrifice that we are able to meet you today Lord we pray that you uh, help us to lay down anything and everything that's on our hearts and minds this morning that would keep us from seeing you rightly worshiping you fully Lord you are good And Lord, by your good spirit, we ask that you lead us this morning. And as we sing these songs of praise to your name, that Father, it's not just words from our lips, but it's words from deep gratitude within our hearts. Father, as your holy word is open, Spirit, would you teach us, would you lead us, would you convict us where we need conviction, but would you also encourage us where we need encouragement today. Lord, as we partake of communion together, Father, may we remember the sacrifice that was given. For you so loved us that you gave your one and only Son. That when we just believe, we have life in your name. And Jesus, it's by your body and your blood that we are made whole. Help us reflect on that today. Help us worship in that reality today. And help us leave this place identifying with you today. Knowing that you are our only hope. And you deserve our all. So, Lord, we bow our hearts before you today. We ask that you meet us here, lead us and guide us. In all of this and all for the glory and name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As Pastor Matthew just said, a little later on in the service, we're going to take uh, partake in the Lord's Supper, communion uh, with Christ. And so I thought it would be appropriate for us to take a moment in our singing to think about what Jesus did on that cross because we want to remember his death till he comes. Let's sing together.
Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. Pay the price for my sins and for your sins. Let's sing together at the cross. It says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to come today and worship with you. Lord, we thank you for the many, many blessings that you provide us. God, we, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the community that we live in, for the nation that we live in. Lord, we 
we pray that you will guide and lead the leaders of our of our community and of our country and of our world as we deal with the many difficult things that we're dealing with. Lord, we pray that you'll be with Pastor Matt today as he brings, brings our message, and Lord, that we will live our lives accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
that doesn't make you ready for heaven, I don't know what, what will. Amen. Revelation 3, we're looking at the church at Sardis this morning as we not only see what the Lord is saying to Sardis in uh, connection with each of these churches we've already looked at, but also as we are preparing our hearts in this moment to end the service today, partaking of the Lord's Supper together, because you realize that is an act of worship in and of itself. We have to prepare our hearts, and the scripture is very clear that we don't just partake of the elements in a lighthearted manner and so eat and drink judgment on ourselves, but that we hear God's word, we respond to God's word, and we have hearts prepared by the blood of Jesus Christ to receive what uh, we are partaking of. And so I pray that as we hear what the Lord is saying to the church at Sardis this morning, as we hear the word of the Lord in our life, we also experience the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to us and respond and end today uh, truly worshiping the Lord through partaking of the elements together. But as we come to the church at Sardis, we are going to encounter uh, what we might call the sleepy church or even more the dead church. We've seen already the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, and the tolerant church. And with each church, we know that they were real churches facing real issues in the midst of the culture in which they were living. Uh, but they also are experiencing issues that are common to the church uh, ever since these seven churches existed. Uh, the church of, of Jesus Christ at, in all time, in all places... Uh, is in danger of experiencing any one of these issues. And so we need to hear the word of the Lord to us each and every time we read the letters to these seven churches. Uh, but just as with all the others that we've looked at, whether it is losing our first love or whether it is compromising biblical values and biblical truth or whether it's becoming tolerant of the culture around us, the danger is before us today to fall asleep what is most important in our life. The danger is before the church, and I mean the church at large, to drift into not only spiritual sleep, spiritual apathy, but even worse, death. And so we must hear the word to Sardis and ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts as we ask, where do we need to wake up today? He says, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God the seven, and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds and that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Where do we need to wake up today? Well, the first thing I want us to see is that we must wake up to spiritual, genuine spiritual dependence. We must wake up to genuine spiritual dependence. In verse 1, Jesus introduces himself, and, and remember, each letter has a different introduction from Jesus. He introduces himself uh, by way of what the church needs in the moment. Because Jesus is the answer, right? Jesus is all things to all. I mean, he is what we need. And so whatever sin we're facing, the answer is found in Jesus. And so when the church needs judgment, he introduces himself as the righteous judge. Well, he introduces himself here to Sardis as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. And he says what he's always said, I know your deeds. I know what's going on among you. But the point is, he introduces himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. This church is facing, facing imminent judgment, yet Jesus didn't introduce himself as the divine judge, but as the one who possesses the spirit of God. Because what, is this church, what does the church at Sardis need in the critical hour? 
They need spiritual life. He has said, you give the appearance to the outward world, to the watching world, that you are a life-giving church, that you have life. But what I see is not a church with life. What I see is a dead church. And let's all just stop right there and, and agree that what Jesus sees is more important than what the world sees. In your heart personally, what Jesus sees is more important than what the world sees in you. Because when Jesus is pleased with the heart in you, then the world is going to see Jesus through you. But when Jesus is not Lord of your heart, the world may see uh, traits of Jesus at times, but it's not going to be a genuine walk with the Lord. And if Jesus is not pleased, then nothing else matters. And, and what we are personally is what we are together as we come together as the church. And so he says, you have an appearance of life, but what I see is dead. This church has a reputation for being alive and, and because the church is the body of Christ. It is a living organism. We cannot treat the church like another organization amidst all organizations in the world. Churches cannot operate like the world operates because the church is not of the world. Churches uh, do not exist among other organizations in society that every other organization can be a part of. A church is not an organization. A church is an organism. It is living. It has life. It is supposed to be the body of Christ, living and active in the world. You can run a business organization from a business perspective. You cannot run a church like you would run an organization. Because first and foremost, the church has to be spiritual. And what I want to suggest to you is that the church at Sardis, well, they had the appearance of life because they were a good organization. They were running things in an organization world pretty good. People in the outside world said they've got it together. They're doing well. And this was to say a lot in the midst of this culture which was totally opposed to Christianity. But from those who would have a little bit of what the church would offer, is saying, well, there's life there. They're doing good things. But Jesus looked on the church and he says, no. From my perspective, you're dead because you might be an organization, but you're not an organism. You're not alive with the Spirit of God. The reality is, from God's point of view, and this is all that matters, this church is dead. This would give indication that this church is being made up of maybe unregenerate people, not true believers, because you see, Christians can fake their Christian walk. You've heard me say recently that we need to be very careful throwing that word Christian around today because it's being, everything is being labeled as Christian. Even uh, people are labeling themselves as Christian and what they're living is a walk that looks completely different than following Jesus should look. And Jesus looks on this church and he says, you are dead. Let me, let me tell you something. The word dead and church should never go together. The word dead and church should never, ever Go together. And sadly, when you look at the statistics at how many churches are closing their doors every single week, it is alarming. Because somewhere along the way, they become, became apathetic to the culture. They became, maybe they, they looked well from an organization standpoint, uh, point of view, but, but the Spirit of God was left out of every, uh, maybe one thing and then another thing, and sooner or later, everything they did. You know why a church dies? A church dies not because its attendance declines. A church dies not because it can't meet its budget. A church dies not because uh, it, it, it doesn't have a staff fully able to uh, carry out the duties of the church. You know why a church dies? Because the Spirit of God is removed from it. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. That means a small church that is gathered of maybe ten people can have the Spirit of God, and it is blessed by God, and it is alive for God, and it can do great things for God. At the same time, there can be a body, a gathering of people of 10,000 people, and all the world's leaders may be looking on it for leadership principles and, and how to, do, uh, how to run, an, run an organization. It's happening in the world today. But the Spirit of God is not on it. And that is a dead church, no matter how many people gather week after week. And what Jesus is seeing here at Sardis is a dead church. Listen to this uh, word from John MacArthur. I love his explanation of the danger signs uh, that a church is dying. 
He says, a church is in danger when it is content to rest on past laurels, when it is more concerned with liturgical forms than spiritual reality, when it focuses on curing social ills rather than changing people's hearts through pre the preaching the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ, when it is more concerned with material than spiritual things, when it is more concerned with what men think than what God has said, when it is more enamor enamored with doctrinal creeds and systems of theology than the Word of God, or when it loses its conviction that every word of the Bible is the Word of God Himself. No matter what its attendance, no matter how impressive its buildings, no matter what its status in the community, such a church, having denied the only source of spiritual life, is dead. It's tragic. And that was Sardis. It was Sardis. They were a church that had a good reputation among the world. But what is a good reputation among the world if it's dead? There's nothing man can do to make church church. Hear me clearly. There is nothing man can do to make church church. Church, a church, a, a, a group of people, a body gathered together only becomes a church when the Spirit of God is among it. A body of people gathered together only becomes church when the Spirit of God is among it. We don't go to the world to learn how to do church. In our meetings, when we meet together, Committee meetings or Sunday school meetings or Bible study meetings, whatever it is. We don't go to the world to learn how to praise. We don't go to the world to learn how to teach. We don't go to the world to learn uh, how to, to handle business. We go to God. And when God is left out, when, when, when sp seeking the Spirit of God, when going to God in prayer, when going to God in decision-making, when going to God in everything becomes secondary instead of primary, we are on the verge of dying. Any church. People will say that, uh, I've heard it said, that it's almost silly to seek God over some things when a group of people meets together, maybe in a meeting or whatever, that a decision is not made, maybe a small decision, and it's almost made fun of when a small decision is not made till time is spent in prayer. Let me tell you something, there's nothing silly about that. When that starts, death is soon coming. And Jesus says, church, Sardis, you need to wake up. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is the Spirit of God among you. Secondly, wake up to genuine fruitful living. Verse 2, he says, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Notice this. Jesus didn't say they didn't have deeds. They had deeds, and this is why that they have the appearance of being alive. They were doing things. In fact, maybe they were doing a lot of things. And Jesus said, but I have not found the deeds you're doing completed in the sight of my God. There is still things lacking, and what is lacking, it may not be the deeds, but it is the spirit behind the deeds. Because you can fool the world with good works. People are doing it every day. You can fool the world by, quote, being a religious person or being a person of good works or being a person of moral standing or, or being a good church attender or whatever. You can fool the world by being that. But if the Spirit of God is not behind it, then God, uh, Jesus does not see it as completed. And so he didn't find this church completed in the sight of God. It, it, here's the reality of the church at, at, at Sardis. They were spiritual zombies. This was a church of a spiritual zombie who was walking around, giving the appearance of life, but inwardly it was dead. And Jesus is giving them a great warning. And here's the answer Jesus gives them. Wake up. First word Jesus says is, wake up, verse 2. It's a command. They could not remain indifferent and okay with going through the motions. They needed to recognize the sin among them. They needed to recognize that good works was not enough. Meeting together was not enough. They had to wake up. And call on the Spirit of God. And then he says, strengthen what remains. This refers to the spiritual realities. This refers to focusing on the spiritual graces of the church. 
This would be referring back to what we might call the mundane things of church life. The preaching of the full counsel of the word of God. Regular and consistent worship with the body of Christ. Making sure it's spirit led, spirit filled. All about the spirit of God and the spirit of God is in everything we do. In its teaching, it is spirit led, it is not man centered. In its business meetings, it is spirit-led, it is not man-centered. In its prayer gatherings, it focuses on God, not on man. In everything it does, he says, go back and strengthen what remains. And then he says, remember. Remember the gospel. Remember strong doctrine. And keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the next one he says, keep them. Keep them. Verse 3, keep it. And then, as always, Repent. Because when, when Jesus points out sin, there has to be uh, repentance. Maybe death is uh, more prevalent among the American church today than we like to think. I've already said the statistics are alarming of churches that are uh, on decay or closing their doors week after week. It's just a downward trend. Why? It's not because we don't have good programs. It's not because we don't have good ideas. It's not because there's not a need. It's not because of resources. It's not because of anything other than the Spirit of God has been removed. Because God is not going to hang around a people that does not keep Him in first place. And that was the church at Sardis. And yet Jesus has told us how revival comes in the church. I love what Vance Havner, a great preacher, once said his definition of revival, he said, Revival is nothing more than falling in love with Jesus all over again. Revival is nothing more than falling in love with Jesus all over again. Let me tell you something. The American church needs to fall in love with Jesus all over again. We need to fall in love with Jesus all over again and make sure that everything we do is led by the Holy Spirit of God. If not, there's a great warning coming our way. Thirdly, he says, wake up to the urgency for genuine repentance. We've kind of already dealt with this in looking at verse 2 and 3 together. When the church realizes its problem, repentance is always the answer. When you realize sin in your life, repentance is always the answer. This church could not uh, remain indifferent to sin and to just spiritual apathy in its life. It had to wake up because Jesus says, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. This is not a, a, a reference to the second coming. Now, Jesus does refer to the second coming as he will come like a thief in the night. And so we've got to be ready. We've got to be spiritually prepared, prepared because the truth is Jesus could come back today. Are you ready for that? And you, you've got to live every day ready because he says that's how when the father says go, he's going and not a second less. But what Jesus is referring to here with this specific church, when he says, I will come like a thief, what he's saying is, I'm going to catch you by surprise, Sardis, and if you don't repent, I'm going to come, and it's going to be the end of your existence. And I think that's why we see so many churches dying today. It's because for far too long, either they have not recognized the spiritual apathy in their midst, or they failed to repent of it. And then Jesus came like a thief in the knife, and he said, okay. We'll move on to the next one. Who does want to rely on me? The Lord does not play around when a people puts him in second place. Wake up to the urgency for genuine repentance in life. We must wake up to that. Repentance must happen and it must happen soon. We cannot play around with the judgment of Jesus. But then lastly, we must wake up to find genuine acceptance by the Father. Wake up to find genuine acceptance by the Father. What about those who do repent? He says in verse 4, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white. There were some people in this church who were on their knees every day. They were crying out and they were saying, Spirit of God, move in our midst. More of, more of you, God, more of what you have. You know why some people don't call on the Spirit of God more and want God's presence on their gatherings more? It's because they're afraid it might make them uncomfortable. And if the Spirit of God makes you uncomfortable, what in the world makes you think you're going to be okay with heaven? 
Because you're going to be in His presence for all eternity. And there were some people in Sardis who said, we want to rely on the Holy Spirit. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want everything that we do to be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. And if it's not of the Spirit, we don't want it. Because the Spirit's always going to work in line with the Gospel and the Word of God. And he says, there's some, and you've not sold your garments, and you will walk with me in white. Because, you know, every one of us, our sin has stained us, but the blood of Jesus Christ makes us white. And he says, he who overcomes, verse 5, will be clothed in white garments. Aren't you ready for that day? Just keep on keeping on. Keep pursuing Jesus. Keep living for him every day. Keep being faithful. Keep being spirit-filled and spirit-led. Paul said, don't quench the Holy Spirit of God. When we sin and refuse to repent, we quench the Holy Spirit of God. Paul said, don't do that, but be filled with the Spirit. In fact, Paul said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You know what Paul was saying there? When somebody becomes drunk, doesn't it intoxicate their body? And they no longer think rationally. They no longer act rationally. And it's very clear that they've been overcome by uh, intoxication. And Paul says, don't do that, but be filled with the Holy Spirit so that everywhere you go, it should be clear that the Holy Spirit is in your life. When you walk in a room, can people tell you've been with Jesus? I heard that said of somebody this week. They were talking about a spiritual hero of theirs, and they said no matter whether he was in church, he was behind the pulpit, he was in a meeting, or he just walked into a restaurant, I could tell he had been with Jesus. I want that, don't you? And he says, he who overcomes, not only will he be clothed in white, but I will not erase his, book from, for his name from the book of life. And you say, well, I thought our names could not be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. I want to clue you in on something here. Jesus is, I don't think, talking about the Lamb's book of life here. He will refer to that later. Jesus says the book of life. In the ancient world, it was very common for communities to have books that they wrote every citizen's name down in. You were a citizen of that community. Your your name was written in a registry in the ancient world and when somebody died their name was erased out of that registry and so I think what Jesus is saying here is I'm not going to erase those the presence of those who keep being faithful to me because I I, I, theologically speaking I I believe a hundred percent that when you're really saved your name is in the Lamb's book of life and when you're really saved the Lord has dealt with you and will deal with you when you sin and nothing can take your name out of the Lamb's book of life. You did nothing to earn your salvation. You can do nothing to lose your salvation. But I think what Jesus is saying here is I'm going to remove this church if it does not repent, but those who will stay faithful, they will still have a presence for me. And he says, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says. Are you living your life in such a way that Jesus can confess your name before the Father? Jesus said, don't be ashamed of me in this adulterous generation, or I will be ashamed of you when I stand before my Father in the presence of all his angels. And Jesus meant that. You see, we have so many people walking the earth today that they will come in church on Sunday and they will claim the name Christian, and then they will go out in the world on Monday, and they will be ashamed to bear the name Jesus. That's just spiritual death. That's just coming in and giving an appearance of something that's not really alive. And Jesus says, but when we really, when we really are changed by the gospel, and we have received the Holy Spirit... We understand the importance of letting the Spirit lead us in everything we do. And we go out and we live the name of Christ. And it is an honor for Jesus to stand before the Father in heaven and say, this is is your son, this is your daughter. Clothed in white, sins forgotten, all because of the blood of Jesus. So, 
Where do you need to wake up this morning? We're about to partake of communion, but before we do that, I, it's very important, I believe, that we have a time of response. And so every head bowed and every eye closed right where you are. Right where you are this morning. And this is how we're going to do our invitation today. Would you just ask the Lord where you are in your seat, where in your life you need to wake up to the things of the Spirit of God? Or maybe where in your life are you on the verge of spiritual death or bringing apathy or death to the church of Christ because you have just been going through the motions, you've been apathetic or you've been trying to do your work at the church like you would do it out in the world. And Jesus says, no, there's got to be more. This is important. Jesus wrote a whole letter to a church about this. And so it's got to be important to us today. And we would ask the Lord this morning, where do we need more of your spirit? Where do we need to rely on your spirit? Where do we need to pray before we move? Where do we need to seek your guidance? And where do we need to rely fully on who you are? Maybe you're here this morning and you're lost, separated from God lost in your sin and he wants to give you those white garments you cannot partake of these elements because this is for those who have identified with the body of Christ but if you give your life to him you can and in your heart of hearts all you need to do is tell God you're a sinner agree that he's the only savior and give your life to follow him or maybe as a Christian in your life this morning there's repentance that needs to happen and the only way you can take, partake of these elements in a worthy manner is, first of all, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, but secondly, living a repentant life. And would you take this time just to make that right with God? And let the Lord work in your heart as He would, so that when we take of these elements in a few moments, it is an act of worship before Him. In fact, this morning, where I'm not going to call for a public response. Just right where you are, in the stillness of where you are, turn your seat into an altar before the Lord. Let Him examine your heart. Make sure that you are awake to the true things of God. And then let's get ready to worship Him. Father, we bow before you this morning. Our hearts, our minds. And we ask forgiveness for the ways in which we have sinned against you. We become spiritually apathetic, maybe even spiritually dead in some areas. And Lord, we need your life. We need to fall in love with you all over again. I pray that, Lord, you speak that into our hearts and you give us hearts yielded to respond to you today father for those that do not know you that need to respond to your grace for the first time i pray that right now even as i'm praying they tell you in their own heart mind and words how much they love you and want to respond to you and are grateful for your gift in their life and lord then that they do make that decision public that after this service, they let myself or one of our staff know of that so that we can celebrate that in the coming days. Father, as we partake of these elements, I pray your blessing on this time of our worship service. And I pray that as we walk out of these doors, that we do so not only having worship through this, but identifying with your body and your, your, risen, your risen body and going out into a world ready to share with a lost and dying world who you are. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray that God has spoken to you today as we have worshipped the Lord together. If He has laid a specific decision on your heart, whether it's following Christ for the first time, or a, a rededication uh, to the Lord, or a prayer need, we take those very seriously. You will have some contact information there on your screen. Please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you in your journey with Christ.